so Sergio, he's he's a brown belt in South Africa, and he's he's a ways, quite a ways, like you know, um, Asia is in um, Cape Town, and I think Sergio's up more by Johannesburg, so you know it's a long flight away, and um, and he's undoubtedly probably the best guy in his gym. So what advice would you give for him? Right. So I think we've we've had this conversation before. Um, go, I'll go backwards and forwards. You know, Hickson was the best in the world. Uh, so when he came to America, even though he was first at the Gracie Academy, he would have had real no competition there. And then when, especially when he shortly after that branched out on his own, he would have, you know, he brought some students with him, I'm sure. But but by and large, uh, was surrounded probably by white and blue belts in the beginning. And obviously, he he continued to get better for quite a while. And then Hodger did the same in London, England. And most recently, I even look at the Mendez brothers who, in, in sport jiu-jitsu, who came to America pretty early, like I think at zero degree black belt, you know, they'd just become black belts. And not only were they uh, early in their jiu-jitsu career, but they were coaching and building building a team and having to, having to coach. And I think they were smart in retiring early while they were still healthy, but they, they continued uh, – to crush everything gi and no gi for several years after moving to America and teaching a bunch of white belts for the first few years. And so I think um, what they probably all had in common and what I, and what, and personally what I did in Korea is you handicap yourself. And so uh, you don't think of winning and losing as much as uh, putting yourself in positions uh, constantly that are mutually beneficial. In other words, Losing to white belts, they know you're losing to them and they know you're babying them. They don't like that. Smashing them unilaterally doesn't help you or them. But if you can let and, – and, and at blue belt, you can give a little less. And at purple belt, you can give a little bit less. But I always told my students when they would tap me, oh, you let me do it, coach. And I said, no, I let you in, but I didn't let you out. Yeah. And so, so I think the strategy is let people in as deep as possible work your way out and you know when it's too deep because they tap you and then you ratchet it back one and you play there. And so I, I've been tapped by most of my white belts and blue belts and purple belts. And, and then later at Brown and black belt, they can tap me even when I'm trying not to let them tap me. But in the beginning, I, we can both get a lot better if I give them as much as possible and then try and take it back. And I think that's just a good way to play. You know? Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. Um, I remember, I don't know if this is true or not. I think this is something that I might have heard from Dan and Asano, but long ago I heard, I don't know anything about tennis, but the analogy was that if you're a really good tennis player and you're playing with people who aren't good tennis players, it messes up your game. I, now, I don't know if that's true or not, um, but I don't think that's true at all in jiu-jitsu. I think you can, I mean, Travis is a good example as well. He went When he went to Montana, he was just a purple belt. Good purple belt, but I mean, he was a purple belt. And right. so he had to start with all white belts and pretty much everybody that he walked through the door he could beat and went from purple to black belt, I think, relatively rapidly in the overall course of things, only seeing me or you or whoever else, you know, every few months. Yeah. I actually think in many ways, especially if you're, well, probably only if you're teaching, but as long as you're teaching, being the best guy in the room doesn't seem like a handicap at all. Right. And, and Travis created a lot of really good black belts along with it. Yeah. 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 Here's good question. I don't know actually where he's going with this, but Abdul's a smart guy. And actually his series that he put up that he shot in the backyard on the SPG Worldwide Members Forum is one of my favorites. He's got some really good material in there about footwork and distance. But he had a question for, you know, Abdul, a brown belt from uh, Carl's Gym in Manchester. Okay. Related to um, courage and cowardice and it's, relationship to technical training. So it must have been something, I think he was referencing something that we must have talked about when we were there. Just wow, I mean, that's that's so open-ended that I, I may miss what he asked, but I'll try to guess what he wanted to hear. Um, I think it might have been something I said about, uh, you know, liking jujitsu more than you like winning. And so it takes a certain amount of courage to like, you know, go down with the ship so to speak. I yeah. mean, you know, as a captain in your, in, in your own jujitsu journey, you're the captain, you're ultimately responsible for it. Your coach can, I tell, I tell my students this all the time, like I could bring Hickson in and he could maybe 
show you a little bit more and explain it a little bit better, but you'd still always have to do 51 or more percent of the work on your own, right? No one can get you past that. And so I think the courage is uh, to do jujitsu even when it's not working and be courageous enough to, to believe that it will work eventually. Like the, the system works right. uh, even, even though there will be a lot of, uh, you know, ups and downs. And, and, and when I say failures, you know, failures in quotation marks, because you and I have talked about this, it's not falling off a surfboard is not failing, it's practicing. And getting right. tapped in jujitsu is not failing, it's practicing. Right. And eventually you don't fall off, you know, but you got to fall off a thousand times. And that, that takes a lot of courage, especially in jujitsu when someone's sweating in your mouth and, and grinding on your face and, you know, the things that your ego doesn't really like to undergo. Yeah. How does the cowardice part fit into it? Well, I think if you're a coward, you, you rationalize and you never make it past blue belt, right? You, you just, oh, jujitsu is bullshit. Or if it were a real fight, I would do this. Or if I had my gun or, right. you know, oh, I'm too busy or, you know, you start that, that's, those are often fear-based. I mean, for everyone who really doesn't have enough time and everyone who really doesn't have enough money, because those people exist in the universe. Um, I think the, there are 99 others who are who are leaving out of fear of some kind. Yeah, unfortunately, that's true. We see that in the retention. Hermantis, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but he had a question to both you and I, and he watched our videos, and he noticed that um, when I'm teaching, sometimes I close my eyes. And in your case, he mentioned that when he watches you teach, sometimes there's a pregnant pause before you begin speaking, and he wondered what that was about. Well, I... I, I'm answering for you in a little, a little bit. I close my eyes all the time when I'm teaching, when I'm rolling. Uh, I just feel like there are more, there are more situations in which, you know, actually feeling connection and disconnection and weight distribution is important. And there's not really that much that your eyes do for you, especially maybe, maybe pre clinch or pre connection. Yeah. Yeah. But once two bodies are connected, it's, it's very much tactile. And so the eyes are almost an impediment. It's and turning them off gives you, you know, more bandwidth for the things you really need to feel. Right. And then the pause is uh, just personality. There's no, I mean, I, I lecture for a living and maybe it's just a habit I picked up, but I wouldn't uh, have him copy me. I, I guess trying to pick my words carefully is what produces the pause, right? I don't want to just blabber. Yeah, you know, you do you do have a careful way with words. It goes along with part of your job and appreciation for the language. I think. That's, I think that's where it comes from. Just just making sure I'm not, um, well, yeah, word salads and all that are, are kind of popular these days. I don't like them. Right. Well, you and I both share a love for writing. You have a much broader education, and that's why you edit some of my stuff sometimes, which is good. But, um. I don't think I fully appreciated how much language can affect even your ability to think until Archie was born. And yeah. when you start thinking about what happens to people who lack uh, language, even concepts like time and uh, metaphor become almost impossible to grasp. Right. And, uh, I wonder sometimes how much even just vocabulary affects people's ability to think. I'm sure it does. Yeah. And I, I'm, it's just coincidentally a non jujitsu uh, thing. And this may be edited out. I don't know, but I'm, I'm, I'm in the end stages of crafting a letter and trying to keep it to one page um, to someone I haven't spoken to in 33 years. And I, and I felt there were significant misunderstandings that I didn't want anymore to leave open-ended. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's been incredibly difficult but also incredibly rewarding just to get the words right yeah and to try to communicate accurately and I, I made the point to this person that we have never had a conversation except face-to-face -face landline telephones and and letters there was no email there was no text there was no nothing so it, it, it's it's interesting to try to sort of revisit that. Yeah, and the beauty of written text is you can take your time and try and make it perfect in a way that you can't. Yeah. Awesome. 
I can't read my own writing sometimes, but I believe this is George, and he's had a question related to, actually you and I talked about this, I think, when I was there last week, but connection from the open guard and how you transfer your weight when you're on bottom playing guard bottom to the person on top. Yeah. So, this, this is a yeah, this is a hundred percent from Henry and Steve Whittier. And it's 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 really situationally it could get very complicated, but theoretically it's extremely simple. I, I connect my feet uh, to the person and remove my hips from the ground. I think from top you talk about keeping your heels off the ground, and I think from bottom it's keeping your hip off the ground, but you're just trying to make the person carry your weight. Now there's going to be all kinds of leg pummeling and they're going to be trying to switch their grips. And so it becomes dynamic, Yeah. but I don't think the objective is dynamic. I think the objective is connect your feet and later, you know, it, it, it might be your enclosed guard. It could be your inner thighs, you know, but connect your lower body, right. remove it from the ground just enough to add weight. Like you, like, your guard passing, you say heels off the ground, but that doesn't mean tippy toes and looking like a ballerina either. Right, right. So I think that I think those are correlated. Your hips are off the ground, or like your hips off the person in mount. Mm -hmm. Your hips only have to be off them a quarter inch. They should you shouldn't be completely upright either. Right. And I think it's something like that, just enough to transfer your weight to them. Okay. Yeah, that's a good answer, and that kind of fits into John Boone's question too. His question. And it goes back to what we were talking about with um, Amantis' question, that they all kind of fit together. But John Boone's question was a hierarchy of the senses, which I think in a way you've almost answered that. And he's yeah. talking about the literal senses, I think, of, you know, sight, touch, smell. But, right, right. So some thing. of them, I've been doing a lot of um, meditation and yoga these days, and some of the mindfulness exercises go through, you know, what you're, what you're hearing and then what you're feeling and then what you're seeing and finally tasting and smelling. Well, in jujitsu, the only way to taste and smell matters if someone's not washing their gi, I guess. Right. Uh, but really, I think the question becomes uh, visual versus tactile. And I, I think, like I said, if you're, if, if you're in a real fight and for some reason the distance hasn't been closed, visual can be very important. What is that person doing with his or her hands? You know, you don't want them accessing, accessing a weapon or are there friends around looking to flank you and hit you in behind in the head? Right. So then visual is way more important, but the moment there's connection and, and in jujitsu, I think, you know, let's put it this way. If visual is most important or when visual is most important, you can probably 90 some odd, percent of the time run away yes and and when you're in a fight that you can't run away from a mugging a, a tackle a, a headlock whatever then it, it's like 99 percent tactile and one or zero percent visual i think yeah yeah and i find a lot of times what i'm trying to do when i'm teaching is not forget to connect before i apply pressure right is that easy is still a habit i have a really bad habit of going base posture pressure because i've been doing jujitsu for a long time and missing the connection piece of closing my eyes and slowing down is my usually i think of my effort to try and feel a connection before i actually apply pressure right but half the time i feel like i i move a lot better with my eyes closed but like you said that's once you have contact with your opponent right right so Franklin, you know Franklin, uh, from my yes. asked about this, and this is this is one that we got quite a few questions. They're all roughly the same, and they're related to warm up roll. How to do a good warm up roll? Warm up roll? Yeah, he phrases a warm up roll. I think he means other people might phrase it as flow rolling or slow. Right, rolling, right. Or, you know. Yeah. So um, that's what almost all of my roles are like, I don't do that so I can get warm and then go hard. Right. Um, but, but you know, there, there, there are, there are, term, right? yeah. Not quite so, but and, I mean, unless, I, unless I'm specifically training for a tournament or someone is going so hard that I feel I have to defend myself. Yeah. Uh, I, I try, I try to basically be using primarily technique, which, I think is what he's talking about. Now, if he's talking about 
a true warm up. Maybe I mean one thing that uh, Henry was doing at the Thailand camp, and I think he does a lot, was you don't go for submissions at all, and you don't try to hold any position, but at the same time, you look for maximum uh, connection and weight distribution. So you can be as heavy as possible uh, with you know, your posture, but there are no grips or you know, head and arm or connecting the hands. And I think that's a great way because if you, cause a really floppy, sloppy warm-up roll gets you warmed up, but turns into bad habits for your jujitsu. And, and a really competitive one isn't a warm-up and you're, li- you're liable to get hurt and learn less. So I think uh, I was really impressed last winter at the Thailand camp when Henry found a kind of compromise where all your base and posture and connection and pressure is there, but not trying to keep any one position and, and, you know, letting the person move under pressure. Yeah. I like that idea a lot. So there's no submissions. They're not gripping. They're yes. not connecting the hands, but you can get as heavy as you want. So the other person can start to get the underhook. You can lay your weight on the underhook, but you're not, for example, going to wizard or something like that. Right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. I like that a lot. That's a good idea. Um, Kristen asked, how has BJJ changed since you started training? Okay, yeah, I've talked about this a lot in, in other places. You know, when I started, um, it was summer in Los Angeles 26 years ago, so it was hot, mm-hmm. and Hickson was still fighting in Japan. And so I didn't put a gi on until fall rolled around. So the first few months, what, we didn't wear a gi. And I think that was typical. I think that's what happened in Brazil as well. They kind of go no gi through the summer. And one day, Luis, you know, one of the instructors there, he's like, hey, man, you got to get a gi. I'm like, okay. So it was interesting uh, in that it was just a given that you had to be good at gi, no gi, and self-defense. And self-defense was a comb- and when I say self-defense, it's kind of a combination of the self-defense techniques, the, the Gracie curriculum of self-defense, but also what would be called valetudo, you know, using jujitsu to defend yourself against someone who wanted to kick or punch you and who may or may not be uh, trained in a style other than jujitsu. Yeah. And that was just, it wasn't negotiable. That's, so that was one thing. It was just a given that you were going to train all three of those areas and be good at all three of those areas. The other difference was, you know, there, there, were, there was maybe one or two tournaments a year. and Maybe. Maybe. And no one really told you to go to them or cared about them either. Yeah. Uh, so the, the whole sport jiu-jitsu scene had not really taken off yet. And, and then – the simple fact was most people were coming in because they had seen the UFC and or a bit later, they had seen Hickson in Japan. Mm-hmm. So even the people who were coming in and were told to put on a gi were coming in because they believed that jujitsu was the best uh, fighting art. Right. So, I mean, those are, I guess those are the major differences. I don't, you know, there's, there are some minor differences, but. Right. So now, how many black belts do you have in Korea? I need to recount. that I've probably given directly maybe 15, and then under them, there's another 30. Okay. So you've given at out. At least. And they're all in Korea, right? You haven't given out an American black belt? I have not. Okay. So you have 15 black belts. Although, belt. I have, a, I have a, an American black belt who got his black belt in Korea who moved back, and he's in Maryland now. But, yeah. They've, they've all been given in Korea. Yeah. So out of those black belts, did you follow the same idea? Um, do they all do a volley tudo as well? So when I teach, when I'm teaching, I teach it as I learned it. Yeah. But when they go to teach and open their own schools, not all of them follow that. And right. I would say the majority of them do not. Okay. And I will tell them my philosophy about having gi and no gi classes and having self-defense. And they will tell me that when they teach no gi, nobody shows up and it's not a viable, you know, business strategy. I think they're teaching it wrong. Yeah. 
And I think if they made the people wear long sleeve rash guards and long sleeve spats under their board shorts and actually, so there's no skin, there's no more skin to skin contact than there is in a gi because some people would be put off by the hygiene part of it. And that's a rational concern. Yeah. And, and secondly, they taught it the right way, which is um, you have to be more precise and more technical because you don't have grips, but they think of it backwards and and say, Oh, people, you know, rip their way out of arm bars and people use, use sweat to escape from things. And it's because uh, they're, they're probably teaching it wrong and they're allowing that. And they're just having everyone free spar. But if you, if you really did more isolation rounds, you really made people cover their bodies a bit more. Um, My, my no gi game, I think, becomes tighter and more precise because I can't grab pant legs to pass the guard, right. and I and I can't grab the gi collar to finish a pass or to hold someone down from cross sides or anything. And so, for me, I think it's it's they're 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 wonderfully complementary, and I I wish uh, more people approached it that way. Yeah, me too. I don't think I ever put a gi top on except when. One of my coaches, Chris, or somebody would come up from L.A. and make me put a gi top on. Right. The rest of the time, up through Brown Belt here in Portland, all we did was fall out to them. It was yeah. every. It was always fall out to them. Um. But I love that, and even to this day, when I'm wearing the gi, half the time I find myself taking, for example, um, same side collar grip just because I'm used to a necktie. Right. Um. But that old material, like you talked about, that forces you to focus more on fundamentals because as you take yes. the off, it becomes more fundamental. You put it in strikes, it becomes more fundamental. That, that, but there's so much depth to it. And right. I wonder because you do a good job of teaching that. I've watched you teach many times. You come here to Portland to teach usually several times a year. Um, and I run into this problem myself where <clears throat> I am constantly talking to my students and, and to my other coaches and to my black belts about, for example, focusing on fundamentals and not teaching your own game and, and drilling it down and, and doing a lot of isolation drilling as opposed to sequence of techniques and let's roll like everybody else does. And still, I yeah. to, you know, there's only a few that actually, I think, actually teach it that way. So I'm glad to hear it's not just me. Yeah. But why is it so hard to get that message across even when, when you try and model it yourself in your own teaching? Yeah, I mean, it's. I think the the – modern jujitsu game is very seductive it's it there's a lot there and it, it's pretty and you can stay physically and mentally occupied just acquiring new stuff and yeah. you know it you know people people like shiny objects you know and uh you think that's what it, it is? you think it's the acquisition phase that oh yeah and just just having having um you know 17 different options here feels good you know but but of course uh that's also because no one's trying to hit you right so i mean they're they're not they're not unrelated right you know it's it's a chicken or egg question like do you do you like all of that flowery stuff because i mean how how can i say I, i don't know exactly how to phrase it but like would it would it even be attractive to you? So, so it's like you, you don't train the fundamentals because you're busy training 17 spider guard options. Right. Right. But, but if, but if you had trained the fundamentals and you did, you know, the way he do and Henry do, you have like a couple classes a week where you put the gloves on and you know, would you have even been attracted to that other stuff? If you knew how worthless it was in any, under any kind of real pressure, you know? Right, and somebody can punch you in the face. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I wonder, too, sometimes Sometimes I've seen some of the coaches and black belts who will go back and teach their own style, but it's not because they don't understand what I'm saying about what I think the, the most and best epistemology is or what you're saying, but sometimes I think it's just because they're, they want to teach what they're good at because they, that's what they feel secure teaching. Sure. And, and how would you help them navigate that route? Um, I, I, I'll give you two answers. I, I, I was expecting a slightly different question, but it's also, they, 
they sort of undersell the students um, dedication to the fundamentals. Oh, they'll get bored and they'll quit. They'll, they, it won't be fun enough and all this. And mm-hmm. so I think they're, they're, they're related, right? So, you know, they don't trust that material. That material um, doesn't need to go any wider at some point. Right. I mean, white, blue, maybe purple, you have to, because jujitsu is a technical game, but you hit a certain volume and it's all about going deeper, right? not wider. Yeah. And they, they think, no, if I don't give them a new toy every day or a new piece of candy every day or something else that's not very valuable but just kind of pleases you for 15 minutes but ultimately rots your teeth and <laughs> makes you unhealthy, you know, um, then they, they'll quit coming back. But I think they're underselling the students and they're underselling the art of jujitsu and how captivating and beautiful it can be going down instead of out, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I, don't, I think I deviated. From, oh, and then their style. Yeah, same thing. They, it's their motivation is is good, but but their reasoning is flawed. So the motivation is good. They're trying not to be a phony and trying not to misrepresent themselves. But you know, uh, you don't have to be a person who won a world championship with this particular guard pass or this particular choke to teach it to a group of white belts who can then refine it on their own. Right. You have you have to know the elements that make it work and convey those very accurately, but you don't have to have finalize 50 guys with it in competition, you know? Yeah. No, that's very true. And that kind of goes into a question from Han. Um, and I think we've answered both his questions. So this first one was how does BJJ training with strikes, which we kind of talked about. And the second one, we didn't, you didn't quite answer this one. Um, and I'm curious what you think the answer is, but his, his follow-up question was, why has the sport version of jiu-jitsu, the version that we see now that's so popular, the gi sport version of jiu-jitsu, become so ubiquitous in comparison to the volley tutor? Right. So the, the first one strikes, I think, is mostly about just managing distance. You know, um, the, 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 the range of sport jiu-jitsu is the worst range. I mean, that mid-range where you're just kind of unconcerned with distance is very good for a lot of different kinds of guards and 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 uh positions from from the half guard and stuff but it's the worst position if someone's on top of you trying to hit you right so i think with strikes you wind up uh either playing a very long game or a very tight connected game and the middle game disappears by and large um and you see even the guys in the ufc who can make sport sport e not sport but like sporty techniques work it's it's, it's often by getting very, very, very close, you know, a deep underhook and their ear connected and, and, and giving no space for any real punches. Right. Uh, the takeover. Um, Where do you think that I, came from? Because it wasn't this, the sport jujitsu takeover. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it is, it is fun in a certain way to do a lot of of fancy things um and it and it is fun for some people to compete but uh even in those gyms save maybe places like atos or 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 aoj where people relocate so it's it's not organic it's not natural it's it's artificial because that's like saying why is gymnastics so popular in some town in texas it's like no people send their kids to that bulgarian dude who opened up a compound down there and yeah. they homeschool them and they're coming from all over the country to become olympic champions and you you have those gyms like atos and people move to raise their kids in san diego and become world champions but there's only a couple of those places in the country and in the world the rest, the, or, the organic schools, you know, uh, that, that focus like Gracie Baja or something that focus on sport, I would say only 5% or 10% of their, of their members are actually competing yeah. in sport. But the rest of the members are, are being subjected to a sport curriculum, yeah. uh, which I don't think is good. But, but because of that, I don't think there's a, a good reason or a necessary reason for it to be this way. In other words, I don't, I think if you look at what Hedon and Henner are doing, 
and the, the huge amount of growth and popularity they've seen, I think there is a huge market for the martial art of jujitsu. And they, they certainly don't uh, disparage sport and he don't even competes from time to time. And Henner used to compete from time to time. And I know some of their students compete. There's no um, for, forbidding competition. Right. They simply won't focus on it. And, and, and in some ways, I think the people who are running commercial schools would actually have more members and better retention and make more money if they were doing something more like what the Gracie Academies do. I think they're succeeding in spite of themselves, not, not because of their curriculum. Right. Why do you think that happened? Why do you think that this, do you think it was just um, pretty quickly, like you said, in Oregon, there were no tournaments. So for us to compete, part right. of, part of the, lack of competition in the early years was just had to actually physically go to Los Angeles to, to do a competition back then, a jiu-jitsu competition. And then, like you said, there was only a few a year. But then very quickly it became, boy, there's, even here in Oregon, there's, you know, when we don't have COVID, there's a tournament, it seems like every month at least. Yeah. Sometimes every two weeks. So why do you think that happened so rapidly? I don't know. I mean, obviously, you know, they're making money and people like to compete. Yeah. I still, I still think though that no matter what market there is for those tournaments, it's, it's five to ten percent of all the gyms. Oh, I sure. mean, the, the people who are competing. So what I think happens with the curriculum, and I really don't agree with this, is, you know, your coach competes. It's, it's like you, you um, uh, let's talk about from the top down. Okay. Your coach is is Andre Galvao, or your coach is Hafa Mendez, and and he's winning championships, and then there's you know a lot of hero worship there's a lot of personality cult and then i want to do his jujitsu or her jujitsu because that's the best jujitsu but it's not you know it it's it's the best jujitsu for winning tournaments and so i think um it's almost it's almost an inversion of the way it should be it should be that everyone is doing hickson's jujitsu and then guys who want to compete can build awesome games on top of it but they've turned that upside down, I think. Right. Right. That's interesting. And that opens up um, some questions I have myself personally. But you look, you know, you can see right away good jujitsu. You can look at something that Henry's teaching or something that Dixon's teaching, and you can, you can see this is more efficient. And then you try and teach that. That's why, you know, you're a coach that everybody in SBG likes to train with because that's kind of what we're about, are those fundamentals. What is it for somebody who doesn't have that background, hasn't been your student for a long time, hasn't been around, maybe wasn't uh, brought up through an SPG gym, what is it that you're specifically noticing when you look at something that Henry's doing and you look at something that Dixon's doing and you say, I like that better? And as, you, as you've said a couple times, which I think is interesting, as you've gotten older, you got more picky about your jiu-jitsu, you became more picky about your jiu-jitsu, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that means you want only to be working on the more efficient stuff. What is it exactly that you are um, witnessing that tells you that's better jujitsu? Yeah. So, yeah, I'll go backwards a little bit. The picky part is for sure my own jujitsu, but I think I was always a little bit that way, mm -hmm. although more so these days. Sure. It's, it's about what the people I'm coaching are doing as well. I used to be much more laissez-faire, like, oh, yeah, I guess you can do it that way. It's your, it's your thing. And, you know, that, yeah, well, that, that works or that could work. And, and now I'm just like, I'll tell them. I, won't, I mean, just say, this is a better way to do it. And, and I can tell you why, right? It's, it's objectively better. And, and so back to your actual question, uh, and, oh, and this goes back to our last interview. You know, it, it, it's not, it's partially that, I, that I'm getting older and crankier, but I, I would like to think it's also that I'm getting more responsible and compassionate and loving as well. You know, because we talked about the real de definitions of caring and love and how, you know, letting people do the wrong thing is not by definition very caring or, or very compassionate or very loving. It's, 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 um, it's the nice versus kind thing that you had that someone just reposted. It's nice, but it's not kind. Right. 
especially not in the long run. So there's that too. The pickiness is, you know, like I said, as we get older, we tend to uh, get a, a little bit grouchier, but it's also, I think I'm, I'm trying to be more compassionate and kinder, you know, yeah. and really care more about my students and not want them to waste time and waste energy. Right. And then when I'm looking at it, the real yardstick, I guess, is efficiency. And we've talked about, I mean, efficiency is such an umbrella term, but, but repeatability yeah. um, and, and uh, efficiency. And, and when I say efficiency, I, I, I mean, you know, basically um, energy expenditure versus effectiveness. Yeah, so I think sometimes some of the people who, especially early on when they're new to jiu-jitsu, find themselves gravitating to some of those sports schools, they're doing it because in their mind, Andre Galvao or whoever it is at the current uh, level doing jiu-jitsu must have the best jiu-jitsu because they're winning the tournaments. Right. Whereas you're actually looking at what's going on there mechanically and letting that decide the jiu-jitsu for you. And that is what led you to the conclusion that Hicks's jiu-jitsu was the most efficient jiu-jitsu. It wasn't his 400 and 0 record. Nope. Any if he stuff. couldn't teach, if he or Henry couldn't teach it to me, it's worthless. It's, it dies with them. Right. Yeah, no, it, it's because I can do it easier than everything else and I can do it better than everything else. Right. Yeah. So you can observe that right away. What's, what would you say to somebody? Uh, how would you coach somebody to do that? Okay. So one thing that you're, just what you said before brought to mind, which is super important and super closely related. Um, on a personal level, like, yeah, you look at one athlete and because he or she wins, you think they're the best jujitsu, but it might be that they have, uh, they're just outliers in strength and cardio and all these things, genetically very gifted, hardworking, a lot of steroids and all these other things. And so, and good or, 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 but, but non-ideal jujitsu that works in spite of its, inefficiency because they're so gifted right. um and and that's on the micro level on the macro level i started one way i i got my students in korea to understand this is we will have athletes come in from uh, wrestlers and judo players from the korean olympic training center and that's where the highest level guys in korea go and and they're not pro athletes but they basically are because they get paid to live and train there and, and you guys Correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys have a really good. Is it second only to Japan? I'm out of the loop. Like you guys. Oh yeah, I mean, they're they're neck and I mean, Korean judo is always at the top, and the wrestling's pretty tough too. Yeah. Um, and what I tell them is, it would be like thinking that the training methods at the Olympic Training Center are the best, but they're actually not. Um, when I when I because I get to see. Uh, the pile of broken bodies yeah. that, that those places produce. So what it's not the best training and it's certainly not the best training for a civilian because what they have is a thousand people in line, all of whom are elite athletes, all of whom have already crushed everyone in high school and university and they're all waiting for a spot. And so you can break 900 of them, knees, shoulders, hips, just broken bodies and then one guy gets lucky or one girl gets lucky they don't get injured they have the right combination of physical abilities and and, and illegal drugs and everything else and they win a gold medal and they're like, oh let's get their training methods and it's like no those training methods are horrible you know <laughs> but they it's that survivorship bias you know you only see the the airplanes that don't get shot down and come back and they're like oh have you seen that that diagram no so there, there, there was a, a, a scientist or a mathematician back in the day in World War II, and the, the planes that got would come back, the bombers would come back successfully, and the dumb guys were examining them and trying to reduplicate them. And finally, one smart guy was like, no, look for where there aren't bullet holes. Right. Because the ones that had bullet holes there are in the ocean now. Right. You know, and they had it all backwards. Mm -hmm. And I think people approach jujitsu and physical training that way too sometimes. Absolutely. It reminds me of what happens in the military. I mean, they have, they're, they're intentionally trying to weed people out. It's yeah. a selection process to find that particular person. Right. And then all these other people, you know, I don't know what the attrition rate is in the SEALs, but it's right. like 80 or 90 percent. All these other people just don't get the training. It's kind of the opposite of what we're trying to do, right? Build people up from the 
from the ground up make people stronger. Right. And the people who wind up getting good in, in those circumstances, as you and I have talked about this a lot before, but they're the people that need jujitsu the less, the least. They right. They were already tough when they walked in the door, you know. Yes. And you know, and I and I think it's totally natural and and normal to want to watch Hafa Mendes do jujitsu, just like you might want to watch Michael Jordan play basketball. Yeah. But that's not that's not how you're going to coach a, a 42 year old woman who comes into your gym and wants to learn jujitsu. Right. Right. For all the SPG coaches and the other instructors who are out there watching this, it will be our monthly podcast. Um, how old are you right now, if you don't mind me saying? 50, no, 53. 53. I'm 51. You're 53. Most of them are younger. Some of them are a little bit older. But eventually, everybody's going to be going to be here one way or another, hopefully. What advice do you have for people doing jiu-jitsu in their 50s now? And what are, what are your current objectives and goals with jiu-jitsu? Right. So um, certain things never change. So uh, if, if you're in your 20s, it's the same. You know, again, believe in jujitsu, really trust the technique. Even when it's not working, it's the right thing to do because it will work eventually. Like jujitsu, like more than you like winning, that, that will take care of 90% of your problems at 20 years old, 30 years old, 53 years old. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm working – a, a good amount of strength. I'm working a good lot, a amount of mobility. I'm work, you know, yoga when I can, breathing. Uh, it's always, there's always a tension between um, time and money, right? Um, limit, time and money are limited. And so if I, in the, at those points in my life when I have limited time and resources, I will f focus on jujitsu. But if you have a little extra time and or a little extra money, I, I think doing some external work on strength, mobility, breathing really pays a lot of dividends. And uh, having said that, I always, it's always important because I don't want to be misunderstood. Um, none of my jujitsu succeeds or fails because my bench press goes up or down. None of my jujitsu succeeds or fails because I can do more yogic flexibility things. Those are about injury prevention and, right. you know, structural stability in my body. But when I, when I, when I win, it's, it's not because I'm stronger. And then when I lose, it's not because I'm weaker. It always comes back to jujitsu and, and being more technical, I think. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the breathing. Um, Glenn's been focused a lot on that. You've been, you've been focused on that. And it seems to be, um, a big part of jujitsu and it goes, it's, it seems to go hand in hand so well as we talked about with a lot of Hickson's curriculum. Hickson's curriculum, like we were discussing last week, fits together so well in a way that jujitsu prior to, prior to seeing the, the full depth of the curriculum, I think what I, what I felt like a lot of times is you have a little bit of guard from here and a little bit of half guard from here and a little bit of mouth from here. But with Hickson stuff, the, the transfer of weight, the connection, the, 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 the going from passing into the cross sides, the escaping, all of it meshes together so well. And yes. I, I can see at this point, though not understand directly and certainly not teaching at this moment, where the breathing would fit in with the rhythm of how all that fits together. But how do you see it at this moment now, having spent some time thinking about it and working on it, where the breathing fits into that. Right. So there's, there's breathing as a solo drill or solo exercise, which is, which is just becoming stronger and more efficient with the, the many muscles involved in breathing. Right. And then there's breathing while doing jujitsu. Um, I am not, I have not, and, and really don't need to do what Hickson did with, with sort of, um, deliberately manipulating his heart rate through breath and things for a real fight and trying to outlast someone in, in, in like a real fight. But in sparring, I simply focus on never breathing through my mouth, never breathing audibly. And if you can do those two things, it, your breathing will be regulated. Um, if if, you if I can you keep your mouth closed while you're rolling. Yeah, breathing through my nose. And then even through my nose, not... 
you know, my partner can't hear me breathe. My coach can't hear me breathe. I think that's a good, that's a good, if, if, if I hear someone breathing, mm-hmm. um, when I'm rolling with them or if, I, or if I'm coaching, I know they're going too hard. And, and certainly when I hear them like grunting, which happens sometimes too, like they have to, they're trying to oop on, it's like, Ugh! or they're trying to come out with an underhook from half guard bottom. And it's like, ah, yeah, it's, I just know their breath is all messed up at that point. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just and, – and, and trying to start and finish rolls with the same breath rate is, is, has been really helpful as well. Um, and people say, yeah, but I can't do that because, you know, he passed my guard. And, and it's like, well, then you're not worried about your breathing. You're worried about your guard. You know, it's, it's about priorities. Right. Yeah. Where would you prioritize breathing? Well, so it depends on every role, but basically, you know, it's, it's the most important in that I want to begin and end with it pretty much even. So it's right. important as like, as, as kind of bookends right. to the role. But then once you have that and it becomes a habit, you can forget about it and prioritize other things. Right. But if, but, if, but if my breathing is going, I'd have to go back to it. If my breathing is, if I can maintain my breathing, then my, it is my priority, but, I, but I'm, I go consciously to other things. Like, oh, do I, do I want to work mount bottom today? Okay, I'll let people mount me and, and stuff. But if, but if any time my breathing goes, I'd have to return to that, I think, as the most important thing. Interesting. Well, John, I'll – I want to thank you for taking the time to do this. This will be our August podcast. And uh, Awesome. No, thanks for reaching out. It's always, always a pleasure and any time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.